Hey guys, people keep saying MPLS is dead, but hold on. If it is dead, why are big service providers and enterprises still spending money on it in 2025? Why do cloud players still give you private WAN options? And why do we still build backup pets with MPLS that fail over in just milliseconds? Sounds weird, right? Maybe MPLS is not dead. So here is the deal. Today, we are doing a quick FAQ. 10 real questions that engineers like us always ask. I will give you straight answers. No buzzwords, no boring theory, just the stuff that actually works in real life. You will hear where MPLS is still necessary, where internet with sd is enough, how to make a clean path to the cloud, how to test the path, and what skills to learn this year. If you run WAN network, service providers, medium to large enterprise networks, branches, 5G sites, or cloud links, this talk is for you. Ready? We go question by question, so you can follow the flow easily. You can watch any question and answer you want. Each question is separate, so you can start watching from any part you like. Let's begin. Question 1. Is MPLS really still used in 2025? Yes, many cores still use MPLS. They want predictable paths, clear SLAs, and fast backup, which is fast reroute when a link or node fails. MPLS provides tight control over the paths, basically. So, traffic engineering, MPLS VPN, and fast rerouting to protect important traffic are the main reasons that we have MPLS in 2025. Question 2. Why do engineers keep MPLS even with SD-WAN? This is one of the most common questions. You see this debate on LinkedIn, Discord, and Twitter almost every week. Some say SD-WAN killed MPLS. Others reply not so fast. Here is the truth. SD-WAN is a policy layer, not the wire itself. Think of SD-WAN like the traffic police. It tells traffic where to go, but it still needs road to drive on. Those roads can be internet, they can be MPLS, satellite, or any of those combinations, basically. What many companies do is simple. They keep a small MPLS core for the few applications that must not fail, things like voice calls, payments, ERP systems. Then they push the rest like email or bulk file transfer over broadband or 4G, 5G links and so on. This mix saves money and keeps safety for the critical traffic. It's not MPLS or SD-WAN. It is used both where they fit. Question number three. What problems does MPLS solve better than internet only? MPLS gives stable delay and low jitter when you need it. It gives traffic engineering capability for the applications when needed. It gives very fast failover when a link dies. Again, I am talking about fast readout capability of MPLS. These things are not possible with internet-only circuits, as the internet is the best effort service. With MPLS, you control the lane. With the internet, you share the road with everyone. With MPLS, you get an SLA, service level agreement, with the service provider, but the internet is best effort. Service providers cannot give you a guarantee for the quality of service. Question 4. What is SR MPLS in simple words? Let's keep it super simple. Think of classical MPLS first. In the old way, we used things like LDP or RSVP. Every router along the path had to build and keep state for the many flows. This meant more sessions, more signaling, and more work when the network gets bigger. Now, Segment routing with MPLS, SR MPLS, makes it lighter. Instead of building state hop by hop, we just push a stack of labels on the packet at the start. Each label is like a sticker with a small instruction, go here, then go there, then exit. So, the routers in the middle don't have to hold any state information. They just read the label forward fast. This makes operations simpler. You don't need RSVP tunnels everywhere. It also keeps the classical strengths of MPLS, speed, traffic engineering, and fast failover, fast reroute. Many providers like SR MPLS in the core because it gives them control, yet avoids the heavy configs of RSVP traffic engineering. Question 5. How does fast failover work here? Important point first. MPLS doesn't always come with a backup pad by default. You need to enable features like fast reroute FRR. When FRR is active, the router will pre-compute a backup pad for each protected tunnel or link. So if the main link fails, the router already knows send traffic this other way, it switch immediately without waiting for the routing to think again. This makes recovery very fast. The idea is repair locally first, then inform the network. The router steer the traffic right away, then later the control plane updates and finds the long-term best path. For the user, this means calls don't drop, 
video stays smooth and apps keep working. In practice, with FRH, failover is often in tens of milliseconds, so fast that humans cannot notice. That's why many service providers enable fast reroute with MPLS. It's a proven way to give strong SLAs and keep critical apps safe even when links or nodes fail. Question 6. How does MPLS connect to the cloud cleanly? You can treat the cloud like another site on your WAN network. The provider builds a private path from your WAN to the cloud edge. This can be an IPVPN model. You keep your routing, your policy and your quality of service end-to-end. -end. For many apps, this feels safer than just the public internet. It also makes troubleshooting easier because the path is known and under your control. Question 7. What services still run on MPLS today? This is an important question because many people think MPLS services are legacy. But in 2025, two services are still very active and many enterprises still buy them from providers. First is L3 VPN. This is the classical service where the provider gives you a clean layer 3 separation between sites or business units. You use VRFs and route targets to keep traffic separate. For example, a global company can keep its finance department traffic totally separate from its R&D traffic, even though both go over the same physical core. Clean, safe and proven. The second service today is actively used is eVPN over MPLS. This is more modern. It gives you layer 2 service, can provide layer 3 as well though, but without the pain of old VPLS. It handles dual home sites very nicely. Imagine a branch that has two uplinks to two different provider routers. EVPN makes sure both links are used, loops are avoided, and failover is smooth. It also removes unnecessary flutes and broadcasts that used to waste bandwidth in VPLS. You can still find EVPN over MPLS in big campus networks, data centers that stretch across skis, and service providers who want to offer flexible multi-homing. Active Active PEC attachment circuit usage meaning flow-based load balancing. This is a very technical topic and uh, let me share the videos that I explain these topics and more about eVPN in the description of this video. So the idea that MPLS services are not gone is not true. They are still standard offers. Many enterprises still buy them. Many providers still run them every day. Question 8. How do I test and watch MPLS pets? Use tools that check the real label pets, not only the control plane, LSP ping and LSP trace route. These tools test the end-to-end -end pet even if it has labels. VFD gives you very fast RUNI checks on links and tunnels. You can also pull live data from devices to see loss, delay and jitter. With this, you don't guess. You prove that the pet is good. Question 9. SRMPLS or SRV6? Which should I pick? Both are good ideas. SRMPLS is often easier when you already have MPLS skills and the devices support them. It keeps labels and fits many cores today. SRV6 is nice when your IPv6 plan and your tools are ready and when your team wants an IP only data plane. Pick the one that fits your rollout, your people, your hardware. You can learn both concepts and choose one of them that is suitable for you. Deployment of uh, SRV6 is much more compared to SRV6 as of 2025. Question 10. What about cost? Isn't MPLS expensive? Yes, MPLS can be more expensive than internet links. If you look at the price per megabits, in many regions, MPLS costs more than broadband links. That is why people often say, just drop MPLS, the internet is cheaper. But here is a trick. You don't need to buy all the capacity on MPLS. Keep MPLS only for the few things that really need it. Things like voice calls, trading apps, or ERP. Put bulk data traffic, for example, backups, email, and web browsing on broadband or 4G, 5G. This mix mean you pay for quality only when it gives value and you save money where high quality is not needed. So yes, MPLS can be pricey per megabit, but if you buy less of it and use it only for the flows that matter, the total bill is under control and you still get safety and SLA for most important traffic. Bonus. What should I learn first if I am busy? Many engineers ask this because the MPLS has so many use cases, services and tools. The truth is, you don't need to learn everything at once. You just need to focus on the core blocks that give you the most value. Let me break it down. First, learn the L3 VPN basics. This is the heart of the MPLS. You should know what a VRF is, 
how route targets work and how import export lets you control which sites can talk to each other and so on. Why? Because 80% of MPLS services today are based on L3 VPN, L2 VPN as well. If you understand VRS and route targets, you already understand most of the MPLS use cases. Second, look at eVPN over MPLS, but keep it high level at the start. You don't have to learn all the route types in the beginning. Just learn why eVPN is better than old VPLS. The key reason it helps with dual home sites. Imagine a branch with two uplinks to two provider routers. eVPN keeps both links active, avoid loops, makes failover clean. That's the big picture you need. Third, learn some MPLS OEM tools. Fast backup ideas like FRR. This teaches you how traffic can survive a failure in milliseconds. LSP ping trace route. This lets you test the real label path. So you don't just trust the config, you can prove the path. BFT, this is the first failure detection mechanism. Why this? Because with OEM tools, you can easily troubleshoot and monitor the links and nodes. Many engineers get stuck not because they don't know VRFs, but because they cannot prove what the path is doing. After that, move on to the SRMPLS idea. Again, keep it simple. Just understand that SRMPLS uses labels as small instructions that carry the pet inside the packet. This reduces the need for heavy signaling. You don't need to know every noob, but you should be able to read configs and understand the logic. Why? Because many providers in 2025 already prefer SRMPLS in their core network, and many are considering it as well. So, in short, learn layer 3 VPN basics first, learn eVPN concepts, understand OEM, and understand SRMPLS at a simple level. If you learn just these four building blocks, you will already be stronger than most engineers who only know configs. You will know how MPLS works in real networks today, why providers still sell it, and the most important MPLS use cases, which is MPLS VPNs. Let me summarize. MPLS is dead is a nice slogan, but it's not true at all. In 2025, MPLS still help with predictable paths, VPNs, traffic engineering, and fast rerouting. Use MPLS where it matters. Use the internet where it fits. Let SD-WAN and SRV6 do their jobs too. When you mix them with care, users stay happy, incidents are small, and your network looks smart. Enjoy studying with Orhanagon.net.